the balance right, ETDD, GUI automation, and exploratory testing, Michael Larson. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for coming to this session. I greatly appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm going to dispense with the slides. There's two reasons why. The first is, is that since this is, an explore, this is an emerging topic session, I kind of feel like being able to have a more free and uh, f open way of talking about these things is helpful. So I didn't want to actually use the slides for this. But the real reason is because my talk became obsolete as of, yes as of yesterday afternoon <laughs> because of a great conversation I had a chance to participate in with Ken Peer and uh, Kim Kaner. And because of that, a lot of the information we got from their session is now a part of my talk. And so I didn't have time to go back and completely redo everything. So this is how we're going to flow. So I'm going to ask you to indulge me for a second. And the reason I'm going to ask you to indulge me is because I'm going to lay the hyperbole on a little bit thick to start things off, OK? So we know that we've got three areas that are actively sold today. If you look at any of the tests, sales stuff, book reviews, et cetera. These three areas are really hot commodities right now. We hear a lot about test-driven development and more recently about acceptance test-driven development. And the idea is, is that because the developers are actually writing their tests while they're writing the code, it's making their code cleaner, they're more efficient, they're, they're already writing the tests, therefore they are testing, therefore why do we need dedicated testers? Point one. Let's take a look at GUI testing. I mean, you open up any magazine. You'll probably find 100 ads for this flavor of GUI tools you want to buy. Or you can go and get the free ones to, to do it as well. And everybody knows it's so easy to go in and record your tests and get a battery of tests very quickly that you can use over and over and over again. And it will be very effective, right? Of course it will be. <laughs> so because of that, again, we really need somebody who can manage and the automation tool. And that's the important factor. We don't really need to have a dedicated tester, right? Point three. No, 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 no. Now let's talk a little bit about exploratory testing. Now exploratory testing requires that you are actively focused and actively engaged. That you are in the code and you're in the bits of it and you're looking at things and you're watching it and you're acting as the user's advocate. And your eyes are the real judge here. You're the one that's really making the decisions. No machine is ever going to be able to outsource that. They're not going to be able to take care of that. And because of that, good, focused, sapient, exploratory, manual testing, baby, that's the way you go. That's the real gem. Right. You all believe that? I hope not. Because in truth, all three of them are right, and all three of them are dead wrong. In no way are we able to, none of these by themselves, let me make absolutely clear that we understand this, none of these by themselves is going to guarantee quality product. It's not. You will not be able to do TDD by itself and guarantee that the, that the product that goes out is going to be high quality. You will guarantee that the tests that were written to meet the requirements of the code do what they're supposed to do. Does that translate to quality? No, it doesn't. It translates to much faster developed code, maybe, maybe much cleaner developed code. But if it's got a hairy problem in it and the test was never designed to find it, you're still stuck. GUI test automation. Pretty tools, aren't they? Lots of, lots of functionality, lots of flexibility, neat things that you can do. But if you don't know how to make those tests extensible, robust, and effective, garbage in, garbage out. It's not going to spell the difference to say, oh, I've got all these tests, and because I ran these GUI tests, everything's going to work just great. Exploratory testing. Can I ask you something? How many of you have enough time to exploratory test every single piece of your product? Really? <laughs> One of the biggest factors about manual exploratory testing is it's incredibly time consuming. That's not a bad thing. And for certain key elements, it's very important. But if you exhaustively exploratory test, 
chances are you're going to miss a lot of stuff in your code because there's only so many hours in a day. This is especially important to me because in my worldview, and again, disclaimer, how many have heard it already about 40 times today, I'm a lone tester. I do my job by myself, generally speaking. I work at an agile shop. I do have developers that practice TDD. We do a lot of GUI front-end automation because of using tools like Cucumber and RSpec. And yes, I do actively use exploratory testing. But I'm just one person in that dedicated tester's role. It's the whole team's job to look for quality. But I'm the only guy who's really dedicated to external kind of consultant testing. So with that, I want to make a couple considerations here. Going back to talking a little bit about TDD and ATDD. These are not test techniques. If anybody has told you that TDD or ATDD is a test technique, they are either misinformed or they are lying to you. It is a design tool. These tools are used to help developers design clean code. We all understand, you start with a test that fails. You may not even be able to compile your code, but you get a test that you know will fail. Then you write a test, you, you continue the test, and you write your code so that the test can pass. And after you have done that, if you're doing your due diligence, you go back and you refactor, and you make sure that everything is nice and clean, and then you repeat the process. That is not testing. That is using test tools to help you design clean code. Test guide development, but they have one limitation. First off, we're looking at very small components. When we're talking about test-driven development, we're not talking about the entire system. We're talking about that class that we've put together, or that module, or that method. That's the focus of the tests that we have. Now, if we've designed our tests so that they can go through multiple methods, that's very cool. But we're not designing our tests to see can method A and method B and method C and method D all connect together and make sure that they're working with each other backwards and forwards and sideways and upwards and downwards? That's not the purpose. So that's the reason why I say TDD, great design tool, but it's not really testing. And I'm sure I'm going to be getting a ton of comments on that when people start to put up their cards. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about automation in general, OK? You can pick your favorite flavor. In my organization, automation means Selenium WebDriver. It means using Gherkin and Cucumber. It means using RSpec and Ruby. Why do I use those tools? I use those tools because my development team uses those tools. We have a common lingua franca, and it makes it easy to go in and see if something's wrong and to make sure that we're talking about the same things with each other. It's quite nice. Let me tell you some things that you can do with automation, OK? You can generate data. If you want to go in and you want to generate a ton of data or make a lot of variables that you can pump into forms, you can do that with automation. Simple. You can pipe and parse I.O. Anybody who's ever used a shell script knows what this means. You can take the output of one program and you can pipe it into the input of another program ad infinitum. It's wonderful. Automation is fantastic for that. You can log actions and you can go back and take a look at those log actions and see if something interesting pops up. Note how I said that? We'll get back to that. We can alert if an assertion is either happening or not happening, if we set it to do so. And we can search for patterns within the output that we get. Those are all things that automation can do. What can't automation do, really? Automation cannot create curiosity. I cannot program a computer and say, go find me something interesting. It doesn't know what interesting is unless I tell it what interesting is. Make sapient decisions. Now, we can come pretty close. We can make a, a decision tree, and we can go, and we can talk through a decision tree and say, yes, this is something we're interested in, but not this one. But in this case, look at this. But it's going to take an awfully long time to do what you and I do naturally. So that's why I say that a computer really can't make sapient decisions. The computer's not going to be able to invent a brand new idea based on a previous test. You're going to have to go through, and you're going to have to apply some effort, apply some exploration, ah, we're getting to that, to make it so that you can make another test that it can consider. But who's doing the exploring? In this case, the computer is not. Now, I do realize, based on the conversations that Ken and, Ken and Kim, I hope that comes across, 
had yesterday that it is possible to do some exploration and some broad chain event actions so that you can invent sort of new ideas, but not the same way that we do when we're just looking at something and go, hmm, well, that's kind of interesting. How about if I go over there? Notice something truly unexpected, and I added this based on talking with Kim, unless you have already programmed it to do so. So generally speaking, if we go through and we, we put some randomization into the code and we have something that appears, we're going to notice, oh, hey, that looks kind of different. We didn't expect that. And if we have made our assertions correctly or made them in a certain way, the system could pick it up and report it and say, based off of the assertion that you are looking for, this is unexpected. But we personally are going to catch that much faster than a computer will. And finally, and this is a loaded, loaded statement, and I know it can go both ways, and I'm sure I'm going to get a big, <laughs> big, big, big pile on when I say this when, d during uh, open season. Automation can't make a judgment call. Automation can tell you something looks a certain way. It can tell you that an assertion passed. It can tell you that an assertion failed. It can't tell you if something is genuinely right. We as people have to make those decisions. And, okay. Now when we get into the idea of exploratory testing, and I want to kind of make this a little bit quicker so that we can get a move on in here. Exploratory testing is a big term. And the phrase that I like the most I got from Michael Bolton when he described to me, he said, exploratory testing is not a technique. It is a mindset. It is the way we think. And based off of how we think, we do other things. When we first start doing test-driven development, we are exploring. When you first design that first test, because you're not even sure what the code's going to do, that's exploratory in nature. When you decide to go in and you want to be able to make sure that you have got the acceptance criteria and you've done enough avenues to look at it to make sure that you're really covering the things that are important, that's exploratory. It's also automated by the time you've done it. The difference, though, is that once you have done it, once you have written it, and you can run it, and you can run it again and again, much of the exploration has stopped. You're no longer exploring. What you're doing now is repeating the steps you've already done. You can throw some randomization into it, and once you've done that, then you've added exploration to the scripted automation you're already doing. By the way, this is just my own personal opinion, I'm not a big fan of the term automation. So I'm a little late in coming to the party and saying this. I much prefer the term computer-aided testing, because that's really what we're doing. Automation is a step. It's an approach. Exploration is a mindset. It's something we do when we think. Test-driven development is a process that uses all of these tools. We can have exploratory automation. We can have manual automation. We can have manual computer-aided testing. And we can have automated, I said automated exploration. You get my point. All of these things can fit together. You figure out the puzzle pieces. It does work. So finally, I want to give you some takeaways that you can consider, and then I'm going to call it to close. So again, as I said the first time, ATDD and TDD is by definition exploratory at first. Over time, it loses that value. But each time you add something new, each time that you are going in to add a new script, you are making exploratory tests. No matter what tool you decide to use, no matter what approach you decide to take, if you are focusing on genuinely delivering business value to your team, they're not going to really care what approach you use. That's the key thing that we need to focus on. Focus on the business value. The tools will take care of themselves. Exploration is ultimately a mindset. And a way that we can keep this interesting and fresh is to utilize personas when we're testing. Try on different hats. Become different people. As anybody who's heard me talk about when I test at SideReel, one of my favorite phrases is, anytime that I really want to start getting it creative and figure out what our product's doing, I do my best to put on my inner 16 to 21-year-old female. 
and use session-based techniques to keep things fresh. That way you keep focused, you keep on the ball, you don't get bored, you don't get overwhelmed, you don't have to deal with the burnout. And another piece that I use in here that I call taxi. And what I mean by taxi, and it's my final point, don't be afraid to have throwaway automation. Don't be afraid for your automation to get you a certain destination and stop. And then you get off the taxi and you go tour. Go see what you're gonna go see, learn what you're gonna go learn. And then call the taxi again, take you someplace else. Get off and go explore again. Thank you very much, I think my time's up. Finished on the second. That's quite uh, remarkable. Very nice. So, once more, um, your cards, please. Anybody? It's a, not a question, but maybe a point for discussion that sure. why why does it happen that people take the view that ATDD, TDDD, or exploratory testing, or the GUI test automation, they exist in isolation. In I, I have been working in testing for like over 12 years now, and I have never seen a single project where any of these things are working in isolation. What we try to solve is a testing problem, and all these things become part of the solution naturally. So why, do we, why does it seem that we are being marketed? In I think a lot of it has to do with marketing, frankly. I think a lot of it has to do with tool vendors and what they're selling. And I think a lot of it has to do with a general prejudice. For those of us who actively work with this stuff, day in and day out, I think we realize that we're always using these tools. We're always va varying our approach. It's not either or. It is always and. But sometimes that's hard to get across to certain people. I think there's a fear. I think there's a fear in some people's minds that if you are not an accomplished programmer, then TDD and automation is out of your reach. And in some environments, that might be true. I mean, if I were to go into a C++ shop and they were going to be writing X unit tests and that was going to be the automation framework, I will confess, I would be at a disadvantage. And I would have a lot steeper learning curve than I would in the environment I currently work in, which is Ruby and Rails. But that's just because that's what I took the time to learn how to do. Whether or not it's 100% useful in all cases, whether or not I'm gonna use everything that I've learned, it gives me a bit of flexibility so that for me, it's, I don't think of it anymore as, well, if I'm doing exploratory testing, well, that's primarily manual, or if I'm doing GUI automation, then that's got nothing to do with test-driven development, or vice versa. They all blend together, and I use a little bit from everything, and I think everybody who spent some time doing it does the same thing. Right, we have on the same string Matt, Wade, and Ken. So let's go with Matt. So I think the comment earlier was, um, why is it either or when it can be and? Which I, I agree with in, in for many commercial software projects. Um, I, I would, I was being snarky earlier, I'm very tired. But I have worked on projects where pure exploratory testing can work just fine and does scale. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody about how to scale it for some definition of scale, and some uh, for some amount of risk, right? Um, some other time. Uh, about the why either or. So this is my understanding based on the, 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 the research I've done. Uh, so it's around 1999, and Chrysler decides to do their Chrysler Consolidated Compensation Project, C3. Um, and they're a big IT shop and they hire Kent Beck and he creates extreme programming along with Ward Cunningham and Ron Jeffries and all the others. Extreme programming comes out of that project. And at that point in time, at that company, those guys looked around and said, these testers aren't helping us any. Uh, they're whining about not having a spec, they're whining about things being ambiguous, they're whining about not being involved early enough in the process, they file a bunch of bugs, 
that we don't understand, that don't really make any sense, and we kind of ignore them, and, and they slow us down. If we didn't have these testers, uh, we, could, we could do it faster. If you look at Extreme Programming Installed, the second book that they wrote, it says, we don't need no stinking testers. <laughs> that was the rhetoric of the time. We can do it all with TDD and APD. Uh, 12 years later, I think we've made some significant inroads. And those same guys, if you talk to them, would say, you know, this exploratory testing stuff, this context-driven stuff, this, like those guys on the right kind of project, if there's a GUI especially, because um, that was a batch project, right? Backend stuff, all database. You could do it with bits. Um, when you have an event-oriented system with humans in it, event-driven, yeah, I think I, if I had to do it over again now, and you could give me one of them crazy exploratory guys, I'd like to have one of them on my team. And I, 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 I glory in that, right? That's great. And my concern uh, with the term automated exploratory testing is the same people that said, let's get rid of them testers and automated are now, we've given them a language to say, let's get rid of them exploratory, because we can do automated exploratory testing. And um, if you Google around, they have written that in their blogs. So I think it's a valid concern, so I'll yield back now. Great talk. Thank you. All right, we have uh, wait. So getting back to the original question of kind of where does this come from, I know for myself, when I came into the testing community, uh, I found a lot of conversation about uh, you know, automation isn't going to solve your goals, automation isn't going to to deliver on all of its claims that it claims to be. Um, and I took that in my early stages to mean automation is bad. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't do automation. We should only do exploratory. We, you know, mm -hmm. we should cut, cut out all of this GUI automation stuff. It's not useful at all. Uh, that was my own misinterpretation <coughs> of what was being said. There were attacks being made, or arguments being made against the claims that automation will solve all your problems not arguments against automation is bad. Uh, and so I think that the way that we talk about things, we need to be careful and, and say things like what you brought here. Of there's a balance. Everything has, has some value. And as you, you bring it all in together to produce this overall testing strategy, testing you know, approach, they, they all have space together. I agree. I think also, I mean, this is also part of the reason why I, I deliberately, as much as I can talk about it, I try to not use the term automation. I deliberately use the word computer, words computer-aided testing. Because by using those words, you force whoever you're talking to to stop and think about what they really mean. Because every one of us uses computer-aided testing. You fire on a computer, you type on a screen, you do anything. You've, write an email or you put, file a bug, you're doing computer-aided testing right then and there, even in that prospect. So there's no such thing as really manual testing. You're always doing computer-aided testing, which means you're always doing some form of automation. It's just to the extent you're doing it and how much of it and how much of it is hands-off or how much of it is completely hands-off or how much runs overnight and you come back and you get a report and if the report is clean, you just go, OK, great. Now, if you've got high confidence and you're making changes that are, and, and I'm, stealing, I'm stealing these words from Kim, so he gets the credit for this. Uh, but it's a good point, and I'm going to share it. Kim basically said, if you have a high confidence that your product is working well, then when you run those automated tests and they come back and they're very clean, you're not getting a lot of beneficial information, but that's OK. You're not necessarily looking for new information or something that's of high value in this regard. What you're looking for is you're looking for a gut feeling confirmation that, yep, we haven't totally screwed this thing up. And we're probably OK, and we can keep going with this. You're not going to be able to do exhaustive testing. If you keep adding more and more tests, and you keep adding more and more automated regression tests that cover thousands or hundreds of thousands of tests, is that going to necessarily raise your comfort level? I don't think so. So it becomes a very expensive process to not get much better feeling. Now, if you've gone and you've made a major change to a module, and you're not feeling really confident that that change is going to 
you know, pass muster, pass, you know, it may get past CI, but when you put it on your machine, yo, what's that going to do? Now those tests become very important, and the information you get from them is very valuable. And it's, and again, that's why I call it a balancing act, because oftentimes you're going to find that tests that you, yeah, the project I'm working on right now, I have something like in the neighborhood of 50 smoke tests that I run every single build, and it takes me about 20 minutes to run. And we're already discussing the fact that maybe that's too much. Do we really need 20 minutes to decide if the product is irreparably broken, or are we going in and somehow just replicating what our unit tests already do? What if we cut that down 25 to 25% of its total volume? Could we still get the good, could we still get the same information? the same gut feeling, or are we effectively just adding tests for the sake of adding tests? All right, we're on a substring of a substring, so Arnold <laughs> will reply to uh, something that Wade said. Uh, I basically won't reply, but I very much like what Wade said, and I think somewhere the blog post or reading material that is available on the net has devalued the automation. And it has kind of created a fear, like what Vert rightly said. What I would see is more people taking up programming as an essential skill. I'm in our shop currently. We are working on the RESTful interface. We automate everything that we can think of. But exploratory testing is still very much part of it, irrespective of whether there is a UI or not. We use XHR poster and any other form to post data on the server. So, for people for, who understand exploratory testing, it will never go away from their mind. But it is important to say that automation is as important as any other activity. Absolutely, it is. I think, again, and, and this, as I told Wade earlier, I, by taking out the, the, the standard words, by having to make people really think about what we're doing, we have to establish new boundaries. And I think, yes, I think for some, exploratory testing is a code word for manual testing without having to know programming. I am not saying that's everybody. James Bach would argue with that. If I were to come out and I would say, that's what exploratory testing means, he'd pounce all over me. So would Michael Bolton, and I'd expect them to. Both of them program, and they're good at it. And they use programming when they explore. Ex exploratory testing is not just going around and poking manually. It's, can I learn something fresh by going a different direction? That looks interesting. What if I poke the box here, where here is something that's never been written into code before? By its very nature, you're doing exploratory testing. And once you put that in a script and you run the script, it might take you into a whole other avenue and say, hmm, that's kind of cool. Now how about if I poke over here? And you start doing this dance, and you start moving around. Exploratory, computer-aided testing. It sounds cumbersome, but again, I think it's helpful because it causes us to break down the boundaries, get away from the old terms, and focus on what we really want to do, which is deliver real value to our customers. All right, now this gets really interesting. Uh, Scott oh boy. <laughs> is, is on, a, on a third level substring, oh, and he baby. probably n uh, he never stops talking when he gets the mic. So <laughs> shall I hold it for you? Uh, come on, this is the first time I've talked all day. <laughs> yeah, so here's, and, and, and it comes back to the initial point. When you, the rhetoric started, people were talking about GUI test automation tools. They weren't talking about automation. They weren't talking about test automation. They weren't talking about automated unit tests. The rhetoric was all talking about these nifty difty GUI test automation robots. The problem is the rhetoric didn't stop. And they got called test automation tools. And then people started talking about it without the tools. And then it became test automation. And now test automation is evil. So we've got this evolutionary semantic problem on top of the qu question, philosophical, value-driven question of what brands, flavors, types, methods, thought processes around testing add value. So we have to get over the semantic and the historic hurdle 
before we can even have a conversation about what adds value. And that's the real problem that we're having is we can't get to the real conversation because of the way that these sometimes capitalized terms get copyrighted by vendors who, who want to pretend that they know how to test because they've made a tool. All right, we'll have uh, Thomas on the comment by Wade. I, th I think this is on the comment by Wade. <laughs> uh, So I sense a little bit of a potential tension between the, uh, the suite of tests that you build up get brittle and you need to prune them because they're no longer adding any value or adding minimal value compared to the cost of maintaining them versus we should add a lot of randomness into our tests with the hope that they'll reveal something new. It seems to me that those are actually pretty much direct opposite approaches, and I wonder if maybe the two of you can try to reconcile those a little so bit. That's an interesting question. Um, I know for myself that when I run, tests have a shelf life, they do. And that's part of why I'm recommending the whole idea of when I, when I say taxi. Taxi is also a catchword that I use for myself. That also refers to throwaway automation. If it no longer meets a purpose, you don't have to keep it around. And we shouldn't have, and especially if you're working with Gherkin and you're working with Rails and Cucumber, it's easy to reorder, reallocate tests. And when I say easy, I don't mean that it's, it's bone simple and anybody can do it. You have to still understand the fixtures that, that lie underneath them and the code that goes with it. And it's, it, it all works great until it doesn't, and then you're stuck. <laughs> so y y there is a little bit of, of maintenance you're going to always have to do. When the maintenance outweighs the benefit, maybe it's time to toss that one and start anew. And the good news is, at least with tools like Gherkin and Cucumber and using our spec and Ruby uh, as the underlying, I mean, and, and you can use other tools. I'm just saying that's what I use. You can create scripts and you can create tests quicker than you can. I, you know what? Actually, look, strike that. Reverse that. I'm putting my own bias on it. For, for somebody who can do this very easily, it's probably a snap. If you don't really know what's going on, it's probably really difficult. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't put value judgments on that. My point being, if a code, if a test, if a feature file is no longer serving a purpose, don't be so terrified of throwing it away and starting down a different path. That's what I mean to say. Yeah. Uh, 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 one second. Card. I need a card. Yeah. So we go with uh, Ken first. So um, these takeaways are, are, are excellent. Uh, seldom we get to the end of something that I don't have something immediately to say. So uh, kudos. I started thinking about um, test, life, test life cycle management. You know how there's application life cycle management? You start with a brand new ATD. TDD test, that's exploratory, just like mm -hmm. you said, right? Yeah. Once you get a suite of them together and you finish that feature, that should naturally move on to the next part of its life cycle, mm -hmm. which is to become part of a regression suite for a new feature that's going to evolve and it's going to need maintenance and you better do it right and it better be clean. <laughs> and then later on, as it kind of ages, and that part of your system becomes something that hasn't been touched in a long time, doesn't give you a problem, then maybe you get to that you know, stage where you want to think about it. What's the value that I'm getting out of this? And also, what's the cost of my running it? I, I actually don't worry too much about my old tests because the cost to run them, to me, is very low until, like you said, they break, right? <laughs> and the benefit that I would get from pruning them doesn't seem to exceed the cost. Okay. All right, we will stop recording, but the discussion will go on. So um, I'll just shut up for a moment that uh, Scott can do his stuff. That was Get the Balance Right, ATTD, GUI Automation, 
and exploratory testing by Michael Larson.